Good morning, church. This day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Doug Gond. I'm the pastor at the Cozad United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome our church family and all of our friends to worship today. Good morning, everybody. Pastor Ann from First United Methodist Church in Lexington. It's great to be gathering with you again today in this way. Um, again, today, Doug and I would both invite you to be sure and like the post where you see this, this worship happening. Um, comment again this week. Let us know that you're here and watching with us and participating in worship. Um, and let us know how many are watching at home with you. We'd love to be able to record your participation in worship during these weeks. Um, Last week at the end of our service, we had mentioned we thought we might do communion with you virtually this week, and we're actually still working out how that exactly works, and we are hoping to be able to gather with you in a live stream format on Easter Sunday uh, to share communion together. So keep that in mind and keep watch for, for more information coming your way on that. You know, friends, our lectionary scriptures hit it on the nail on the head again this week um, and provided us um, a scripture that shows us um, another way that we connect with Jesus and that Jesus connects with us. Um, in our scripture today, we're going to hear the story of Jesus um, raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, we're going to experience Jesus um, stricken with grief, a grief born out of love for this friend of his. We're going to hear Jesus speak hope into Lazarus's tomb, um, calling his friend forth from death as a sign of God's glory and of our hope in new life. Um, we're going to hear Jesus call on the gathered community to unbind Lazarus, to free him for new life. And it all comes at a time when COVID-19 has completely kind of interrupted and upended our lives. Um, there is an abundance of grief in our community right now. There's some fear. There's some uncertainty in the air. And friends, today, we are just so glad to be gathering with you in this way even in this virtual way that is very different and feels different, um, but it allows us to be together so that Jesus can meet us right where we are today, knowing our grief, speaking hope into our hearts, and calling on us to love one another in new and intentional ways. Friends, as we begin worship, I'd invite you to grab your candles and let's light those candles together now as we begin our worship. Ann and I invite you to join us in our call to worship as we begin worship. Coming from those places that have seen better days, God calls us to celebrate this day, a day full of new possibilities. Coming with our breath taken away by grief, the Holy Spirit breathes new life within us, renewing our connection with God and with one another. Coming to worship, seeking a hope that will endure. Christ calls us to believe, speaking in word and promise, and building community for holy service that unbinds us all. Friends, let us pray. God of life, present and promised, you are the one to whom we call. For you are the one who hears, and you are the one who acts bringing us new life with your grace and your love and your power. Lead us this day in our time of worship that we may be prepared to follow your lead into places where life is at risk, places where hope seems far away. When we leave this virtual space, God, help us to live the teachings we proclaim 
and help us to serve the God we trust in response to our worship. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Ray Jackson from the Cozad United Methodist Church shares his gift of music and song with Great is Thy Faithfulness. So this morning we wanted to give a special shout out to all of our folks that are really jumping into the fray and helping us figure out how to stay connected with children and families. Specifically, I want to say thanks to Heather who did our very first virtual story time that we were able to share on Facebook this week. Um, we want to give a shout out to Tammy Paulson who um, led a virtual Kids of the Kingdom message for the kiddos at COZAD this week on Wednesday. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to Lori and the church office who's been resourcing children and families on the Lex Church website, um, to all of the students and mentor mentors who have rallied to participate in virtual classrooms for confirmation, which is really different, um, but they're all just really giving it their all in those spaces. And a shout out to the Camp Kamika staff and especially Micah who um, stepped into one of those virtual classrooms with the youth group at, at COZAD United Methodist Church this week and, and had a great session with them um, to stay connected when they weren't able to go out to Camp Kamika this week. I just give thanks for all of you, all of you volunteers that are thinking about ways of getting creative and, and connecting not just with the young people but with, with each other during this time. Um, but we thank you, thank you, thank you. So as we get ready to um, hear our scriptures today, I, if you have your Bibles at home, I'd invite you to grab those now. Um, and we're going to read this morning from the Gospel of John um, in chapter 11. We're going to uh, share a reading of verses 1 through 45 today. My apologies, I didn't get the, the slide changed. We originally thought Kurt was going to be joining us today, um, and he wasn't able to, but he will be here with us next week to help read scripture. So Doug and I will read you through the, through the, what, through the scriptures today. Just as an introduction to our reading out of the Gospel of John, uh, 
Gospel of John points to stories where Jesus returns to the issue of faith again and again. The crowds were fickle, sometimes believing and sometimes not. Religious leaders refused to believe because Jesus didn't fit their understanding of being the Messiah. The disciples and close friends constantly faced challenges that challenged their faith, especially when Lazarus dies. Our text today urges all disciples to have faith in Jesus, even in difficult times, because he is the source of life. Here's our text today from John 11, verses 1 through 45 in the New Revised Standard Version. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And after he said this to the, said to the disciples, let us go to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi. The Jews are just now trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death. But they thought that he was referring to merely sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had heard this, when she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. When she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, 
where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the understanding of God's holy word this day. Join me in a moment of prayer. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be a delight to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, the Gospel of John begins emphasizing that Jesus, or the Word, you notice in the Bible the Word is capitalized, Jesus was with God and the Word was God, and in him was life. You know, the message uh, paraphrase describes this incarnation of Jesus as God became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. A reading today helps us to see the fullness of Jesus being truly God and truly human. Do you suppose that when God moved into the neighborhood that Jesus had friends like you and I do? I've learned over the years that there's a difference between having a buddy and having a friend. A buddy likes the same activities that you do and you hang out together. But a friend... You not only like the similar activities, but you make the effort to develop a deep relationship over time. You share deep conversations about the purpose and meaning of life. You share one another's burdens. When they are happy, you are happy. And when they are sad, you are sad by their side. In this text, Mary says, Lord, he whom you love is ill. We learn from the statement that when Jesus, who was God, moved into the neighborhood in human flesh, made close friends. See, the Greek word used for love in Mary's statement was not the agape word for love of serving one another, but it was filio, a brotherly love, or friend. I invite you to take a moment to think about your friends. Lifelong friends developed at school, work, and within your church family. Since Jesus had friends, he understands your grief when you're not able to be with school friends to play sports. Grief felt when you're not being able to see friends each day at school. A grief of not being able to go to the prom and the anxiety of seniors wondering if they'll have a graduation ceremony this year. Jesus understands the anxiety and the depression felt when not being able to be at work with your work friends and being prevented from earning a paycheck to pay the mounting bills. Jesus shares your sadness when we cannot gather as a church family to worship God together in person. But I need to make something clear to you. Our God of life did not cause the COVID-19 virus. Just as Doug noted, 
God did not cause COVID-19, but you better believe that God can be glorified in it. Um, in our scripture today, Jesus says that Ill this illness, Lazarus's illness, will not, does not lead to death, but to glorify God and to help others believe. We, of course, know that sometimes illness does lead to death. Jesus is not being callous here in this text. He, he's hearing the same news that his friend, the one that he loves, is sick. But Jesus trusts in God, and Jesus knows God has a purpose in, the, in our text today. Three times throughout these 45 verses of scripture today, Jesus makes his focus very clear. This situation is meant to glorify God. And Jesus' actions are meant to help people believe in who Jesus is. Jesus doesn't rush into the scene. You know, he didn't hear the news and rush. Um, he actually held back two days longer. It's Jesus trusting in God's timing here. I know, we know um, how hard it is to be isolated at home. We know that it's hard when it seems like there's not really anything going on, maybe no diagnosed cases right in our communities to be holding back from school and worship and sports and all of the things that are part of our regular normal life is hard. But God has a purpose here. God is working at this time. God wants to meet us where we are. God is at work in our families. God is at work challenging us to be the church in a very different and much needed way. I think we're being called to trust in God in ways that our comfort level and the privileges that we have day in and day out have prevented us from fully trusting God for some time. Meeting this challenge to be the church will come with some risks. Jesus informs his disciples, our friend Lazarus is dead and tells them they're going to Judea again. On the one hand, the disciples share Jesus' desire to gather, to grieve over the loss of their friend. On the other hand, they remember the last time they were in Bethany. Jesus just about got stoned to death. Then there's Doubting Thomas, who I believe was unjustly given this negative nickname, steps up in this moment of fear with courage, telling his friends to also go that we may die with him. Today, we might not be facing an intense risk of enacting as a follower of Jesus, but we still do face risks. Small businesses are taking a financial risk and laying off workers because of their overriding concern for employee health. Church volunteers take a risk by offering to make phone calls to our church membership to make sure that they're okay. These calls will likely surface emotional stress and depression, spiritual doubts, and economic needs which will weigh upon our church volunteers as they share in their burden. Likewise, friends take a risk as they call old friends and family, which might lead to them hearing about suffering they don't want to hear. Today's text teaches that Jesus and his disciples are called to encourage others to believe in God during times of struggle and disappointment. I know he will rise. Yes, I believe. Jesus first encounters Martha before Mary. Martha goes to him and says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. However, Martha already trusts in Jesus' healing power. She's seen it at work. And so now, even in the face of death, she is trusting God through Jesus to save her brother. Jesus tells her Lazarus will rise again. Death is not the end. The worst thing is never the last thing. And already, Martha believes. 
She believes in who Jesus is. She names it. She says, Messiah, Son of God, the one coming into the world. Friends, God will be glorified through COVID-19 as more and more of us trust God. And as we live with Jesus as the Lord of our lives. God will be glorified each and every time you share a meal around the table with your loved ones. God will be glorified each time we spend reading a scripture with our kids or a spouse or on our own. God will be glorified in every note of encouragement that is sent, every phone call that is made. God will be glorified in the ways that we are holding back from our normal routines as a way of loving our neighbors, especially those who are most vulnerable to the effects of this virus. We're slowing the spread. We're flattening the curve for everyone. It's hard to stay at home. It's our natural instinct to go and be with somebody who, who needs our help. Even in our story for today, Mary had a house full of guests who came to share in their grief, in her grief. And when she gets up quickly and goes out of the house, they followed her because they thought she was going to continue to weep at the tomb. They followed her so they could weep at her side. COVID-19 guidelines prohibit the normal large gatherings of family and friends to mourn the loss of a loved one. A week ago Friday, I led two graveside services. The McNulty and the Marshall families need our prayers, cards, and calls to support them in the days and weeks and months ahead. Today we read that Jesus, when he saw the community coming to him, following Mary to grieve, Jesus was again greatly disturbed. As Jesus was full of grief, we were reminded of the reality of Jesus' humanity and depth of love. Of course, we get another story where we see our story, human story, our humanity shine through in the text. Our brokenness is somehow always present. Martha, the very one who believed just a few verses ago, comes in doubting Jesus here at this point. Warning of the stench. How often is it that we focus long and hard on the negatives, the things we don't believe can possibly happen, the ways we're being inconvenienced, and the things that are really hard right now? So what if this week um, we change our focus? What if, we, what if we simply turned our attention to the possibilities that God has set before us? What if we saw these inconveniences and difficulties and struggles as an invitation from God to do life differently? What if we could see the time we are given here in this weird space to simply love our families more intentionally? What if we saw this as an opportunity to reach out to others to simply let them know that they are loved by God and by their church? What if we took this opportunity to spend time with the God of life who loves you and calls you friend? You know, the disciples removed that stone and Jesus prayed. We get these amazing words right at the end of this, toward the end of this section, where Jesus prays and the word of God spoke and Lazarus came out. Jesus extended that invitation to Lazarus to come out, he called him to come out. Jesus didn't go in and drag him out. Lazarus responded then to the invitation of Jesus that he was given, and he exits his tomb. Jesus calls then upon the community that is gathered around him and says, unbind him, free him. He could have come out unbound, but Jesus always looks to us to be, the, to be the community for people, 
we're needed in this process of helping free one another from that which binds us. So what is it in this time of lightened schedules, of more time with your families at home, of living with caution, of holding back and waiting on God's time that you can do to come out of your tomb? How can you respond to Jesus's invitation of new life? Or maybe during this time, you're actually being called to help unbind someone else, free someone from their loneliness or their isolation, to simply love someone who may have no one in this time of uncertainty. So friends, we're living in a really key time in our history. I've encouraged the confirmands to, to make some notes and to write during this time because these are stories happening in their lives that they will share with their children and their grandchildren someday. I think it's times like this that show us who we are. And I know it is times like this where God shows us who God is. It's our prayer for all of us in these days that we trust God will be glorified. That we will carve out intentional time and space to listen for the word of God to speak through our scriptures and our prayers. And that we respond to Christ's invitation to new life and to being a community of love for those in need. I invite you into a time of prayer. We'll have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll guide us through uh, pastoral prayer where I'll say at the end of a phrase, uh, paragraph that says, Lord, in your mercy, then it's your turn to respond. Hear our prayer. So we'll do that, and then at the end, I'll lead us at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together in silence. Holy God, thank you for the gift of new life that you've given to us through the waters of our baptism. Help us as your baptized people to die to sin and to rise to new life with Christ in the power of the Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are mourning the death of a loved one. Comfort them in the knowledge that Jesus has won victory over death. Keep us from fearing death. At times of doubt, help us put our faith in Jesus. As we move closer to Easter, help us to live as Easter people who face death and the certain hope of resurrection. Remind us and comfort us every day with your promise that we will be raised up together with all who have died in faith in the faith of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all medical workers, and people who work at our care centers, keep them strong, protect their health, and give them peace to do their difficult work with dignity and sensitivity. We pray for all people whose work has, has required them to stop. We pray for provision in their need and peace in their worry. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Heavenly God, restore to us life so that we may serve you in the world. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and 
and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us continue our worship this morning with uh, giving of our regular tithe and any missional offerings. You know, I'm excited to learn this last week that there's another person at the Kozad United Methodist Church that just signed up for regular automated giving to the church. This is important because it helps us pay our missional expenses throughout the year, but especially during this time when we're not worshiping together in person. Friends, we give thanks that we love and serve a God of comfort and of grace so that when we cry out from the depths of our despair, our grief, our worry, our fear, we trust that God hears us and knows our pain and our concern. We trust that God is with us, um, helping us with strength and support. And today, we bring more than our gifts and our offerings today. We bring our whole selves as an offering, ready to use our hands, our feet, to be Jesus's comforting and strengthening presence to others. Friends, we invite you to jump online at the end of worship and or prepare your mailing uh, to go in the mail on Monday. Um, we invite you to do those things joyfully and faithfully in the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Let's offer an offering prayer together today. From your hands, O oh God, come the blessings that make life possible, even the very gift of life itself. In gratitude and thanks, receive from our hands this portion of our labors. By your Spirit's leading, may we use these gifts to bless the life of others with the assurance of love, the promise of hope, and the course of justice. We do all of this into your glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. So friends, here we are at the end of another virtual worship service. And I give thanks for your presence. I give thanks for your patience and your grace. <laughs> um, and I just, again, I can't wait to be back in worship with you. Um, I appreciate you all hanging tight and following the guidelines we're given. Um, I think it will help us get back to those sanctuaries sooner if the more of us that can follow these guidelines. Um, Doug, do you have anything else today? Nope. I'm ready for the benediction where you go out and be the church this next week. <laughs> From home. From home. <laughs> All right. So friends, I would invite you to speak the words in bold at home um, with your families. We are a people loved by God. We will, we will live as signs, signs of this, of this love. love. We are a people blessed with hope. We will live we will in light of this hope. this hope. May the love of God the grace of Christ and the courage of the Holy Spirit strengthen our faith and set us loose to share God's love with everyone this week. Amen and amen. Amen. Blessings, everyone. Go in peace.